Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Tonight we are going to learn about fasting. Fasting is <clears throat> fasting is a uh, voluntary. Okay, it's a uh, voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. You know when we when we humble and we deprive this outer man by fasting and abstaining from food, automatically the inner man, the spiritual man, he comes alive. He's strengthened. And all our senses, they, they become very, very sensitive to the voice of the Lord. It is like what is said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 16. Of course, in a very different context. But it says that even though our outer nature, it seems to be wasting away, yet our inner nature is being renewed day after day. And this is what fasting does to us. It, it renews. It brings alive. It strengthens the inner man. So many of our biblical heroes, they practice fasting as an integral part of their spiritual disciplining. Take, for example, Moses. Moses fasted 40 days and nights. He ate neither bread, nor did he drink any water when he went up the mountain to receive the commandments of the Lord. Then there is our King David. You know, King David had that adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, and they had a son together. Then one day, the prophet Nathan confronted King David and said to him, your deed is scornful in the eyes of the Lord, and therefore that child that is born you is going to die. Then King David prayed and he fasted, hoping to find grace in the eyes of God. The most evil king in the whole of the Jewish history King Ahab, he fasted. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, you know, they, they brutally killed an innocent man. His name was Naboth. They killed him only because they wanted to take possession of his vineyard. And Naboth didn't want to sell, sell his land to them. And so they killed him. And then the prophet Elijah confronted King Ahab about this. And Ahab felt really repentant for what he had done. And he demonstrated his repentance through fasting. So many, so many of our biblical heroes, even the villains, they practice fasting as a regular part of spiritual disciplining. Also, you know when our Lord Jesus taught us about fasting, Jesus said, when you fast, don't look dismal like the hypocrites do. Now, note very carefully the selection of the Lord's words, okay? The Lord said, when you fast. He did not say, if you fast. So clearly, it seems that Jesus also assumed that we would practice fasting too. So please allow me to encourage all of us, me included, about why we must fast. And in fact, why we must make fasting a regular part of our spiritual exercise. And for this, we are going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 8. The Lord says, Is it not the fast I chose 
to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the tongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your home and when you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your kin? Then your light will break forth like the dawn your healing will spring up quickly. Your vindicator will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rare God. These are the verses we're going to be studying tonight. First, the Lord says to lose the bonds of injustice. You know, in Mark chapter 9, uh, one day a man comes up to Jesus and he says, My Lord, please heal my son. He's an epileptic. And sometimes he throws himself into the water. Sometimes he throws himself into the fire. And I took my son to your disciples, but they were not able to heal him. Then Jesus rebuked the demon. The demon immediately came out of the boy. And the boy was instantly healed. So then the disciples, they took Jesus aside. And in private, they asked Jesus, why was it hard that, that we were not able to cast it out? And Jesus said, because these come not out except with prayer and with fasting. Applying the story now in our context, you know, there are many of us who absolutely struggle with what is called besetting, habitual sins. I have a few of them I quite struggle with myself. These are our, our pet sins, you know, that we, we simply can't help but we come at them over and over and over again. We feel absolutely disgusted with our sinful behavior, and we know that what we are doing is displeasing in the eyes of the Lord. So we repent. We do. But only to hopelessly go right back to committing that besetting sin again and again. If you may say, we're like a dog who simply cannot help himself, but he goes right back to his very own vomit to relish it, licking it all up again and again to its last bit. Or you may say we are like a, a pig. No matter how many times you bathe her and you clean her, she simply cannot help herself, but she'll go right back to wallow in the muck, in the dirt, and in the grime of the earth. So, we too simply can't seem to help ourselves, but we go right back to committing that sinful, disgusting, besetting sin again and again. These are demonic strongholds my dear friends. Demons who seem to have us all bound up. They're riding on our backs, forcing us, making us do the things that we don't want to do. Maybe it's pornography. Oh, masturbation. Or lewd, dirty, vulgar talking. Or flirting, promiscuous behavior, compulsive eating, cheating, lying. These besetting sins, if we don't control them, they eventually control us and they totally destroy our life. And there are strongholds 
You know, we, we cannot lose free. We cannot break free from them with ordinary human willpower. No. But we can break free, as Jesus recommended, with prayer and with fasting. For the, for the sake of convenience, uh, these fasts have been given names. And, and this fast is called the disciples' fast because Jesus recommended it to his disciples. You know, and I tried out the disciples' fast. And I realized that abstaining from food, it made me so physically weak that I did not have the energy. I did not have the strength to do the wicked things that I would have liked to do. And then in my weakness, I couldn't help but just submit to the Lord. And then he strengthened me with self-control. So the next time round, I was able to say no to that besetting sin. And I was able to lose myself, to free myself from its bonds of wickedness. Or like the word says, the bonds of injustice. Also, pet sin or not, I mean, praise God if you all are not struggling with any pet sin. But nevertheless, you know, I would suggest that we carry out this disciples' uh, fast regularly as a part of spiritual exercise so that our inner man is strengthened. He's always ready for combat. He's ready to say no to temptation at the very onset rather than later on struggle with it as a stronghold in our life. I mean, isn't prevention better than cure? Look at John the Baptist. You know, John and his disciples, they fasted regularly. And John, he neither drank wine, nor did he have any strong drink. And if he ever ate, it was only locust and honey. That's all he ate. He so disciplined his outer man. He so brought his flesh and all its cravings into subjection. He so strengthened his inner man. And see, there's not a single sin recorded against John the Baptist. In fact, he lived such a righteous, such a godly life that even Jesus said of him, of all the people born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. So I encourage us all to practice the disciples fast regularly for our spiritual disciplining. And the verse promises us, it says, then your righteousness your vindicator will go before you. Second, the Lord says to undo the thongs of the yoke. You know, sometimes we are faced with very complex uh, situations in our life, uh, very complex decisions to be made, and we're confused indecisive. We don't know which way to go. Say, for example, you've lost your job. And you've been out of a job for quite a while now. And you wonder, should I stay put in this country? Or should I return to my own homeland? Or maybe it's a marriage proposal you've received or a business proposal that you've received. And you're wondering, should I accept or should I not? And these moments of indecisiveness, these moments of confusion, you know, they can leave us feeling pretty burdened, pretty yoked under in our spirit. And we just hope that the Lord would 
shed his divine light on our confusion and, and sh give us some clarity on the matter. Show us the path that we need to take. Then it is time for us to pray and to fast what is called the Ezra fast. You know, Ezra had this kind of complex situation on hand. He had to lead the Jews back to Jerusalem after a very long captivity in Babylon. And Ezra knew that there were many roads between Babylon and Jerusalem. Some of these roads were infested with thieves. Thieves who would not only loot you, but they would massacre, they would kill brutally. And Ezra was confused. Which road do I take? What action plans do I make? How do I manage so great a people entrusted to my care? Where do I start? What do I do? Where do I end? He was so confused. So he just declared a corporate fast. Everybody prayed and they fasted for the wisdom of the Lord. And the Lord himself gave clear-cut instructions to Ezra about what he had to do. And Ezra was able to resolve the confusion immediately. Yet another biblical story. Saul. When Saul was on his way to Damascus and he encountered Jesus en route, Saul was struck blind. Now, not only was Saul in an utter state of darkness because of his blindness, but he was in an utter state of confusion, perplexed. This Jesus, is he Lord or is he not? His disciples who have been persecuting, should I be killing them or should I not? He was so confused. So he prayed, and he fasted, and along came Ananias, laid his hands on Saul, and immediately light broke forth in Saul's darkness. Saul was able to see again, and he saw so much, he saw so clearly that he knew he had to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of his life. My mother one day, she very sweetly shared with me a time in her life when she was very perplexed and how the Lord helped her to make the right decision. When my mother was in college, was not married, my, my daddy used to be her math tuition teacher. And my mother hated math so much she hated the subject so much <laughs> that she couldn't help but just detest the teacher who was trying to teach it to her. But someday, one day something very unexpected happened. Daddy proposed to mom. And mom tells me she was so confused because in as much as dad was a good man, he was a kind-hearted gentleman, but he was years older than my mother. And he was such a nerd. <laughs> Always playing around with numbers. That was the last thing my mother wanted. <laughs> also, daddy was very dark skinned, you know, but my mother was very fair and very, very pretty. And as if all this was not enough, daddy had nothing with him. He came from a little town named Karwar in Karnataka. It's in the south of India. And he was only a paying guest in Bombay. He had nothing with him. While mommy, like any other young girl, she would have preferred to marry somebody who was reasonably wealthy, well-placed in life. So, even though all the odds were clearly against my father, Yet, because my mother was a very prayerful young girl, 
she decided to pray and to fast and to ask the Lord what was his decision in her life. And I think that's such a sweet thing. I really wonder how many of us do that nowadays. But my mother says that the Lord simply put in her heart very, very peacefully that daddy indeed was her husband to be. And so they got married. And voila, you have me. <laughs> but if at any point of time in your life, you're confused, you're indecisive, or maybe you've decided, like my mother, decided, but you would like to confirm your decision with the Lord, then pray and fast what is called the Ezra fast. Third, the Lord says to let the oppressed go free. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, it was the time when Eli was the high priest. The Philistines, they attacked the Israelites in battle. They defeated them and they totally massacred them. Eli had two sons and the Philistines killed both of them and then the Philistines, they captured the Ark of the Covenant and they took away the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant now represented the presence of the Lord. When Eli heard the bad news that his sons had been killed and the Ark of the Covenant taken away, he was so shocked that he just fell down dead right there. And his daughter-in-law, she was pregnant at that time. And when she heard the bad news that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away and her husband dead, she was so distraught, she just suddenly gave birth. She had a son. And because at that time, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord had been taken away, she decided to name her son Ichabod which means the glory of the Lord has departed. Thereafter, the Israelites, they really suffered great oppression, great tyranny in the hands of the Philistines. And they longed day and night, they longed for the presence of God in their midst. So then, along came Prophet Samuel. And he got all the people together. He told the people to firstly throw away, do away with all your false gods and your idols. He got them all to repent for having prayed to all these false gods and idols. He got them all to pray and to fast and to rededicate their life wholly to the Lord. And this they did. And so the Lord restored his relationship with his people. The Ark of the Covenant was literally returned back to the Israelites. Then the Israelites went into battle against the Philistines. And this time, they won. And they knew oppression at the hands of the Philistines no more. If we were to apply this story in our lives... You know, just like the Israelites, we too have so many false gods and idols that we worship. Our job, number one idol, our finances. I mean, I didn't know. I just realized that I had put more trust in my finances than I did in my Lord. Our our social standing, our status, all these are false gods and idols in our life. Just like the Philistines, they captured the Ark of the Covenant, so do these idols, these false gods. They capture our heart, something that ought to have belonged wholly to the Lord. Just like the Philistines, they, they took away the Ark of the Covenant. They took away the glory of God from the Israelites. 
So too, these false gods, they take away the glory of God, the presence of God from our life. And then, even though we, we have it all, we have a job, we have money, we have, we have our, a house, family, everything seems to be fine. And yet, we feel an unexplainable emptiness, a void, like something has been taken away. We feel like Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has departed. Then it is time for us to repent, to pray, and to fast what is called the Samuel fast. You know, when I was um, just married, uh, young, I had everything a young woman would want. I had a great job, a great title, an awesome paycheck. I had two palatial homes, <laughs> two cars, two housekeepers, two pet dogs. I had it all. I didn't need God. But I remember I'd always feel a sense of emptiness in me. It was like, even though I had it all, yet it felt like I had nothing at all. And today, I don't have any of the things I had at that time. I have nothing at all. And yet, it always feels like I have it all because I have the Lord. So, if you want to restore your relationship with God, if you want to have a very intimate bond with God, like you were your best friend, like you were your husband, then pray and fast the Samuel fast. And the verse promises us, it says, then the glory of the Lord, it will be your rare God. Fourth, the word says to break every yoke. In 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, the prophet Elijah, he had a great spiritual victory on Mount Carmel. Over there, he, he killed all the prophets of Baal. And that made the very evil queen Jezebel very angry. And she swore, one way or another, she was going to get her hands on the prophet Elijah, and she was going to kill him. And this made prophet Elijah very frightened. So he ran, he fled for his life into the wilderness. He sat there under a broom tree, all terrified, all scared, depressed, suicidal. And he cried out, Lord, enough, Lord, please. Take my life. And then suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and the angel gave him some supernatural bread to eat and some water to drink. And Elijah had it all because he was so tired, he went back to sleep. And then the angel came for the second time and gave him some supernatural bread and water, which he had again. And then on the strength of that meal, Elijah went 40 days and nights without any food. He traveled all the way up to Mount Horeb, where he had an encounter with the Lord. And then all these feelings of depression and suicide, they were all gone. They were all healed once and for all. And just like Elijah, so many of us struggle with these negative emotions, you know, depression, suicide, fear, low self-esteem, grumpiness, constant irritation. And these negative feelings and their strongholds, we can break free from them when we know who we are in Christ. 
when we have an encounter with the Lord, just like Elijah did, with prayer and with fasting, what is called the Elijah's fast. And the verse promises us. It says, then your healing will spring up quickly. And the last fast. The Lord says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your home and when you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your kin? One day, Prophet Elijah, he com comes across um, a widow and her son. They were really poor. This widow, she had just a little flour and just a little oil in the cupboard. And she was planning to make some bread out of it, the last bread that she and her son would eat. And then they would sleep and they would die of starvation. And then along comes Prophet Elijah saying, can you please give me some bread to eat? But this widow, she was so large hearted that she wanted to share that little bread that she had with Elijah. So she decides to fast. She decides to sacrifice her own share of bread only so that Elijah could have something to eat. And I think that's so sweet. And look at us. I mean, by God's grace, I don't think any of us here know the real pangs of prolonged hunger, right? Praise God for that. But our stomachs actually are, are spoiled brats, you know? We, we really pamper them with all kinds of rich food in plenty. Even while there are millions of people out there, little children who are dying of starvation and abject poverty, would it then be too much of a sacrifice for us to abstain from maybe a meal or two here and there? Abstain from expensive meat, expensive food and luxurious hotels? Save that money. Put it in your envelope of lentil sacrifices. And give that envelope to the church so that the church can use the money to feed the hungry to give shelter to the homeless, and to give clothing to the naked. This is called the widow's fast. And you know, when we sacrifice our needs so that we can help others meet their needs, it really touches the heart of the Lord. You know what the Lord did to this widow of Zarephath who wanted to share her little bread with Elijah? The Lord blessed that little flour and that little oil so that that little amount was able to feed not only Elijah, but her son and herself for three years and six months. So let us make a little sacrifice. Abstain from rich, expensive foods. Save a little money and bless the poor and in turn, be blessed yourself. About how we must fast, how to prepare for a fast, we have a video. So enjoy it, and God bless you. Every year, as a church, we pray and fast because we want to hear from God. Soak ourselves in the Word and be in faith together for what He will do in and through our lives. When we fast, we humble ourselves before God and declare that we want Him more than food. By denying ourselves for a time, we are better able to focus on God and become more sensitive to His voice. As we enter a time of prayer and fasting, here are a few things to remember. Prepare spiritually. Prepare physically. Commit to a type of fast. Prepare spiritually. Corporately, 
we fast to consecrate ourselves, our families, and ministries to God. Know that simply not eating does not have any spiritual benefit. Believe God for greater things as you list your faith goals. Be expectant for God to answer and for God to transform you in the process. Prepare physically. Start eating smaller portions and meals seven days before you begin your fast. Avoid food that is high in sugar and fat. Two days prior to the fast, eat raw fruit and vegetables only. Consult a doctor if you need to. Commit to a type of fast. Commit to a water only or liquid fast for the week. However, if you are unable to do so due to certain circumstances, there are alternatives like having one meal a day or doing a combination fast. You can eat one meal for a day or two and do a liquid fast for the rest of the week. Do not decide about the type of fast on a day-to-day -day basis. Commit before the fast and ask God for grace. Be ready to hear from God, respond to His Word, and believe for breakthroughs.